Welcome, everyone. This is Magic and Mountains. The T.A. Barron Podcast. Hello, Tom. Hello, Jane. So good to see you. It's good to see you. How are you? <laughs> yeah, oh, doing well, doing well in this crazy time. Oh, it's a horrible time, Tom. It's a beastly time. It is, but you know... Like you, I suspect, I try to center myself all the time about the blessings that we have, and it helps. Yep. Jane, are you at home now? Yes. Just got back from Tanzania. So were you at Gombe? I had four days at Gombe, four days in Kigoma, five days in Dar es Salaam, and three days in Arusha. Brrr. Wow. <laughs> but I was with my two oldest grandchildren. All the way. That was nice. How old are they? Well, Merlin is 26, and Angel is 22. Oh, I love it. What magnificent names, Merlin and Angel. Yeah, well, their mother's Tanzanian, so those are very Tanzanian names. <laughs> marvelous, marvelous. I'd say very powerful names, too. Is that behind you, I see, is that your beloved mother and also David yeah. Greybeard? That's mom, and that's David Greybeard. And, um, well, there should be Rusty, but he's you, you've taken his place. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> nobody can quite take their places, I think. Jane, the very first time I heard you, have I told you this? It was, I believe, somewhere in the mid-1970s where you gave a lecture at St. Catherine's College, Oxford University. And I had just arrived as a Rhodes Scholar. And I saw Jane Goodall. I snuck into the back of the lecture hall, and I heard you speaking about your studies of the chimpanzees. And you were early in your life enough that you were still clearly finding your way and choosing the language and figuring it out. But what a powerful, shining example. Jane, you have made such a difference to the whole world and to my life personally, enormously, as you have with Curry and our children. I'm so grateful to have this time. So let me dive in. Jane Goodall needs no introduction. <laughs> but hey, I can't resist. So Dr. Jane is... That courageous, boldly original scientist you know about whose observations changed our understanding of chimpanzees, primates, and humanity. She's also the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute, whose programs worldwide in community-based conservation are making an enormous difference in more than 60 countries. Jane is also a United Nations messenger of peace which has to be one of the most glowing, beautiful titles of any kind ever conferred on anyone. And Dr. Jane, as she's belovedly called around the world, is so much more. But I think the best introduction of all is simply to read a paragraph that you wrote, Jane, to the supporters of the Jane Goodall Institute. You wrote, I have often shared that every single person makes an impact every single day. And you get to choose what sort of impact you make. Each of us has the power to create a harmonious world for people, other animals, and ecosystems. Over my lifetime, I have seen inequities such as poverty and unsustainable consumption create unparalleled existential crises, which have the real potential to create an environmentally uninhabitable world. But these human-driven crises also have human-driven solutions. There are millions of examples of hope all around us. I am so proud of what we have accomplished and 
As I reflect on all we have left to do, I am invigorated by your investment in building a better world for all. I see hope as the light at the end of a dark tunnel. And through our efforts, we are getting closer to that light together every single day. Thank you, Dr. Jane. (laughs) Wonderful words. And the best thing is you live those words. So, my friend, I would like to start with a question about childhood, your childhood. As I think about the amazing, challenging, and ultimately inspiring life that you've led, I have to think that there were seeds of those qualities in your childhood. I think about a story like that you actually hid out in the hen house, didn't you, for several hours when you were four years old, just because you wanted to find out how a chicken lays eggs. So first of all, is that chicken story true? And what were the primary influences in your childhood that helped strengthen you in these core qualities? Well, you know, the main driving force behind who I am today was my amazing mother. She supported me. And this is so important, I think, for a child that, you know, a little boy may say he wants to be an engine driver. Don't say, oh, how ridiculous, you're not going to do it. Well, what a great idea. And of course, later on, the little boy won't want to be an engine driver. But I think supporting what a child wants is really, really important. So to go back to your hen house story, Mum took me for a holiday in the country because we lived in London. I was passionate about animals and I was given the job of, of, you know, collecting the hen's eggs. All the animals were out in the field, not a horrible factory farm. They didn't exist back then. And I apparently kept asking everyone, where's the hole on the hen big enough for the egg to come out of? Well, nobody told me. So I distinctly remember seeing this brown hen going into one of the hen houses where they slept at night and laid their eggs and thinking, I suppose, ah, she's going to lay an egg. So I crawled after her. Big mistake, she flew out. So my little (laughs) four-year-old brain must have thought, well, no hen will come in here. It's a frightening place. So I went and hid in an empty hen house. Yes, four hours. And finally was rewarded. I saw the egg plop out rushed back to the house. By this time, it was getting evening. My mother had actually called the police. And you come up really scared. But sure. instead of, how oh, dare you go off without telling us, don't you dare do it again, which would have crushed everything, she sat down to hear this wonderful story. And if you think about it, that's the making of a little scientist, curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer, deciding to find out for yourself, making a mistake, not giving up, and learning patience. And a different mother might have crushed all that scientific curiosity, and I might not have done what I've done. Yes, so true. And I would add, there's a sense of wonder in there too, with your curiosity. Amazing to see you in a four-year-old I spent all my time outside, and you know, there was no television when I was little. It hadn't been invented. So there was nature and books, and I loved books, and it was because of reading Tarzan and falling in love with this glorious Lord of the Apes when I was 10 (laughs) years old. And you know, little girls of 10 are very romantic. And um, that's when I said, I will grow up go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. Everybody (laughs) laughed at me. How will you get there? You don't have money. It's far away. It's dangerous. But not mom. She just said, if you really want something like this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't give up, hopefully you find a way. What a fabulous mother. Yeah, she was amazing. And the world is... All the better, because she encouraged those qualities in her young daughter. Speaking of Tarzan, I remember when you once told me that you like Tarzan, but he married the wrong Jane. Yes, that's right. Well, he did, Uh, didn't he? (laughs) (laughs) He he did. He did. She was awfully... I I knew there wasn't a Tarzan, but 
but um, it really <laughs> did make me, it, it set me on my road to Africa. And, you know, I've taken that story about mum, what she said to me around the world, particularly to young people, particularly girls in disadvantaged communities, and so many have written to say, thank you, you taught me because you did it, I can do it too. That's such a crucial idea right there. And you've conveyed that by living it. You know, as I've watched you and admired you over now more than 40 years and loved you, I think there are two core values that, for me at least, come through everything you do. One is the idea that everything is connected, and the other is the idea that every person can make a difference. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, except that it's not that every person can make a difference. Every single day you live, you make a difference. It can be a bad one. It can be just not changing much, or it can be positive. Mm -hmm. That's the choice. That's right. That's right. So we can passively make a difference, or we can, by our own initiative and mindfulness, make a difference. Yeah. Jane, how do you keep those values strong in our world today when there is so much trouble environmentally, pollution of the air and the oceans, forests and ecosystems being destroyed, extinctions happening in terrifying numbers? How do you maintain that sense of powerful, empowering hope well, you know, a lot of people say to me that they've lost hope because of all the problems you just mentioned and all the ones you haven't. And if you look around the world, I defy anybody not to feel depressed because it's depressing. Um, so the thing is that people then feel helpless and fall into apathy and do nothing. And if that happens, particularly to our young people, we're doomed. Right. So how do we give people hope? Say, well, don't think globally as we're told and then act locally. Act locally first. Do something that you care about in your own community, maybe collecting trash, maybe planting trees, maybe volunteering in a shelter, whatever. And that'll make you feel better and you can inspire others to help you. And then you can think, well, there's people like this around the world doing the same sort of things. And then finally, you dare think globally. And the reason I keep my optimism is I swear there are far more decent, good people on the planet than there are uncaring. And, you know, we know there's those. We know about them. We could name them, many of them. And, you know, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, the planet can provide for human need, but not human greed. So we mm. get these big corporations, and they're just taking natural resources faster than nature can replenish them. And unsustainable lifestyles mean that right. as, as more people rise out of poverty and want the same kind of unsustainable lifestyle, what's going to happen? So that has to change. Absolutely. And it sort of is changing, you know? Mm hmm Are you sensing that? Yeah, I, I am, because mm -hmm. of the youth, but we've come back to the youth. But, you know, on the other side, there's, there's poverty, because if you're in desperate poverty, you're going to destroy the environment to survive, cutting right. down trees to get firewood or, or um, make money from charcoal or timber or make land to grow more food. Now, I have greatly enjoyed so many of your books, but two that really rise to the top are your Reasons for Hope and the Book of Hope. 
And in there, you enumerate the baskets in which you find reasons, genuine, powerful, compelling reasons for hope. One of them is the power of young people. And I completely agree with you about that. Another is the human intellect. And another is our indomitable human spirit. And then finally, the resilience of nature. Could you please talk a bit about all four of those baskets? Okay, well, let's start with the resilience of nature. And when I first arrived at Gombe, where I studied chimps, uh, back in 1960, it was part of a forest that stretched across Africa. When I flew over in the late 1980s, I was shocked. I mean, I knew there was deforestation. I wasn't prepared to see a small island of forest surrounded by bare hills. And hmm. that's when it hit me. Why are, the, why are the hills bare? A, there's more people living there than the land can support. B, they're too poor to buy food elsewhere. Their farmland is overused and infertile. And they're struggling to survive. So it hit me then, if we don't help them find ways of making a living, without destroying the environment, we can't save chimps, forests, or anything else. And so JGI began our Take Care or Tokari program, which uh, didn't involve a group of arrogant white people marching into a poor African village and telling them, oh, we're going to help you, this is what we're going to do. No, no, it was a locally selected team of seven Tanzanians who went into the 12 villages around Gombe and asked them what we could do to help. And that's where we began. Gradually, it, it came to, you know, not just restore fertility to the land without chemicals, by the way, um, better health and education facilities, water management programs, scholarships to give girls a chance of secondary education, which wasn't happening back then, um, microfinance programs so that People could start their own small, environmentally sustainable business and family planning. And that program is now in 104 villages throughout Chimp Range in Tanzania. And it's in six other African countries where we work with chimps. And so the people have become our partners in conservation, understanding that saving the environment isn't just for wildlife, it's for their own future. Brilliant. So if you fly over the area today, you won't see the bare hills. Give nature a chance and the trees are coming back, many of them from seeds left in the ground. The farms wow. have moved because people realize these steep slopes, the terrible erosion happens mm -hmm. and animals' biodiversity is creeping back. That's just one example. And there's also the examples of animals on the brink of extinction that are being given another chance. Yes. And I love the humility underlying that approach that you've just described too, as well as the questioning, let's get above the problem and see what's really going on here. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so the, the second is the human intellect. So it's the one thing that makes us more different from other animals than anything else. And the other animals are way, 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 way more intelligent than people used to think, not just the apes and the monkeys and the whales and the elephants, but also birds and domestic animals and right down to the octopus. I mean, unbelievable intelligence, but none of them, even the brightest, they can't design a rocket that goes up to Mars with a little robot that takes photos. And isn't it bizarre that the most intellectual creature that's ever walked the planet is destroying its only home? I mean, yes. I'm sure, Tom, you've seen that photograph from space of this little blue and green globe surrounded by the dark black infinity of space. The most amazing photograph ever made. Yeah. And we're destroying it bit by bit by bit. But Finally, where scientists are beginning to use their brains to come up with innovative technology, improving solar and wind and 
and tide all the time yeah. and various other ways helping us to live in greater harmony and we yes. as individuals are beginning to think about our own individual footsteps yes uh, environmental footsteps so you know the human brain we got ourselves into this mess now we must use that intellect for all we're worth get more girls into stem education because yes. girls have a nice um caring side to them very often yes yeah and so we have to count that as one of the reasons for hope because mm -hmm. we are very bright when we set our minds to it there's nothing we can't do in fact some of it's scary aren't you scared by ai i am i am absolutely just as i'm scared about genetic engineering mm. oh don't talk about that but you know at the core they are tools, right? Forget about artificial intelligence. Take something as simple as a hammer. And you can use a hammer for something good. You can help build a house for someone. Yeah. Or you can use a hammer for something violent and hit people over the head with it. It's up to the holder of the tool. It's not the tool itself that's the danger, is what I'm saying. It's the user of the tool. Yeah, it's the user. That's where we have to rise to a higher level of intelligence to use these things wisely. And that's where many governments are failing miserably and using this amazing tool for, for spying on each other, for interfering in other countries' politics, for creating weapons of mass destruction. I mean, we're in a pretty grim situation right now. Yeah. So... Luckily, one advantage of the numbers of people that are on the planet is that there's enough people to come up with the good uses to yes. counteract the bad uses. Hopefully, yeah. that's, that's what we have to hope. And by the way, hope isn't just wishful thinking. I mean, I could wish that I could fly. That's wishful thinking. But hope to me is about action. And I sometimes see our species right now as at the mouth of a very long, very dark tunnel. And right at the end is a little star, and that star is hope. But it's no good sitting at the mouth of the tunnel and hoping that that star is going to come to us. No, no, no. We have to roll up our sleeves, crawl under, climb over, work around all the obstacles, all the ones you mentioned, between us and hope. And the good news, there are groups of people working on every one of the the problems that we face. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, they tend to work in silos. So you might solve your problem. And if you're not thinking of the big picture, you are not thinking that, oh, that's caused a problem somewhere else. Yes. So, you know, you find a way of irrigating your crop and you don't realize that this is draining the aquifer and leaving other people in a desert. Mm. So we have to get together. When you point to those groups of caring, mindful, compassionate, dedicated people, that's really that third basket about the indomitable human spirit, isn't it? Yep. And I know one person, he's in the book, but his name is Chris Cog. he's Canadian. And he was born with arms that were to here, little, about the size of a wrist, mm. uh, little tiny things each side, no legs, something that might be a rudimentary foot coming out of his thigh. And he goes around the world on a skateboard. There's nothing he doesn't do. Uh, he drives a tractor. He... You know, he'll hop up on the sofa beside you, and I'm offering to sit on the floor. No, he hops up, and you look into his eyes and his face, and you see startling intelligence, but even more amazing, a great love of life and enthusiasm mm. for living and defeating obstacles. And that is the indomitable spirit, you know? I totally agree. As you know, I write about fantasy characters who are invented, who show qualities like that, but they aren't nearly 
as inspiring and powerful and amazing as the real world examples of that. Yep. And they're all around us, aren't they? They're everywhere. In fact, I always say all of us have an indomitable spirit, but so many don't grow it. They just keep it in. They don't realize it's there. They need to let it out to inspire others and make the world better. Exactly. They're, they're afraid. Uh, they feel that they can't make a difference. And so they shut in that spirit. And that's got to change. That's why every individual matters and makes a difference every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then my last reason and my best reason for hope is young people. Yes. And, Tom, you know about our Roots and Shoots program, don't you, which began in 1991 with 12 high school students in Tanzania. It's now in 67 countries and growing. It's got members in kindergarten, university, everything in between, all choosing three projects as a group, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And they're changing the world. They're changing their parents. They're planting millions of trees. Uh, they're, they're raising money, like right now, for refugees and for the people suffering in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And young people have this, they have this indomitable spirit. And they're not going to give in. And they have hope. Yes. And if our young people lose hope, we have had it. So I feel my main job for the rest of my life, however long it is, is giving people hope. What a wonderful life's mission. It's so important, Jane. And I believe that that is exactly the highest and best place for us all to put our energies, is encouraging these wonderful young people who have intelligence and courage and honesty and high ideals, and they will not settle for the idea that they don't have the power to make a difference. They know they have the power. Well, that's once they've been educated, but so many are just left with them. They don't have any opportunity to learn those things. You know, I was talking to some untouchables in Nepal, and when I was talking with translation, obviously, some of them began to cry, and I, I saw it. Why are they crying? Nobody has ever told them before that they matter. Mm. So there they are, forced to work in the salt mines. Mm. One of the most powerful things we can do because of all of this, don't you agree, is to tell stories. To tell stories of real young people like the ones you're talking about. And also tell stories about places and experiences that help convey a sense of empathy for others and other places that may seem far away or removed. You know where the bananas on your table come from, yeah. but also give you a sense of your individual power. Yep, absolutely. And you know, one to me very powerful story about the effect that young people can have I was talking to the CEO of a big international corporation and he said, you know, Jane, for the last eight years, I have been really, really working to get my company ethical in the country where we source our products, making sure the wages are fair, working with the local community, trying to treat people fairly along the supply chain, being ethical in our offices around the world and treating our customers in a, in a decent, respectful way. And he said there were three reasons. One, I saw the writing on the wall. I saw that in some cases we're using up natural resources too fast, faster than nature can replenish them. Secondly, consumer pressure. People are beginning to want to buy products made ethically unless they're very poor when they can't have that choice. And so obviously companies will respond to that. But he said, what tipped the balance was my little girl of eight coming home from school and saying, Daddy, they're telling me that what you're doing is hurting the planet. That's not true, is it, Daddy? Because it's my planet. <laughs> How beautiful. Yep. That's it. That's it. 
What a ringing, powerful voice that eight-year-old girl has. Yeah, and I've taken that story around the world, so. Mm. It's marvelous. And, you know, that's why we have over here a Young Heroes Prize that's for encouraging young people who are stepping out and doing something positive for the good of the whole. But I think that we human beings really take in our biggest ideas from stories, don't you? And that's why we need to couch things, as you do so beautifully, and you always have. In a story, let me tell you about a place and a time and a marvelous creature named David <laughs> Greybeard. And then everyone is leaning forward. I've seen you do that in our living room. And all the children we had assembled, lean forward. Tell us, tell us about David, David Greybeard. Greybeard. I'm the first chimpanzee to lose his fear of me. For four whole months, they'd vanished whenever they saw me close. And I was having to learn only through my binoculars. And money was for six months. And I was terrified if I didn't see something that was special that would be the end. I would have let Leaky down and my dream would come to a full stop. But then that one special day when I saw David Greybeard, very recognizable from that white beard, you can see it in the picture behind me. And he was crouched on a termite mound and a black hand was reaching out and breaking off grass stems and pushing them down into holes in the termite mound. It was a time when the princes and princesses, they call them, fly out to form new colonies. So all the soldiers are at the entrance to the tunnel guarding it. And so they bite onto the grass stem and David was picking them off with his lips. And I saw him pick a leafy twig wow. and to use that as a tool, he had to pluck the leaves off. And at that time, it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools. So it was the breakthrough observation yes. brought in the National Geographic. And then I could relax and gradually got to know the other chimps and their different personalities yes. and their behavior so like ours in so many ways, even to the extent they have a sort of primitive war as well as love compassion. Yes. And they're highly social. And one thinks in reading your descriptions of them, that they also have a sense of wonder in their own lives, in the quiet moments when they're sitting by that waterfall or that rushing stream. Yeah. Well, they get very excited as they approach the waterfall. It's maybe, it's only a tiny stream, but it's a rocky bed. So the water is falling 80 feet and landing on this rocky bed. And so gradually there's a roaring sound and then breeze is displaced from the ravine down which the water falls. And the chimpanzees do these wild displays, stamping through the water, throwing rocks, giving their ooh, 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 and sometimes climbing the vines beside the waterfall and pushing out into the spray. And then <laughs> you can see them afterwards sitting and they're looking up, their eyes are following the water. It's coming, it's here, it's going. What is this? What is this? And I swear, if they had spoken language, that it could lead to one of the early animistic religions, you know, the worship of the sun, the stars, things that people didn't understand. Yes, yes. You ultimately did Dr. Leakey more than proud, didn't you? And that observation you just described, I just want to say, for the record, it, it really did redefine how humanity looks at not just our fellow creatures, but at ourselves. As you said, we were defined as man the tool maker, right? And then after that, I remember reading something that Leakey said that was to the effect that now that Jane has made this observation, either we have to redefine tools or we have to redefine man. Or accept chimpanzees as humans. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, you know, the more I got to know about the chimps and the more, you know, I watched mothers raising their children, I 
saw their emotional lives. I saw grief when a mother died uh, from her child or the other way around. Um, I saw males competing for dominance, showing aggression and anger, looking just like some human male politicians, by the way. Mm. And I saw, as I've said, a sort of primitive war, but also compassion and true altruism, as when an unrelated male adopts a little motherless orphan. And yet when I got to Cambridge University, because Leakey told me I had to do a PhD and I hadn't been to college and I was very nervous and I was told I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have named the chimpanzees, they should have had numbers. I couldn't talk about them having a personality, a mind or emotions because those were unique to us. But gradually, and I didn't confront them, that's not my way, I just went on writing about chimps as they are. Yes. And I'd had this wonderful teacher when I was a child who taught me in this respect the professors were wrong. And he's also up behind me, my dog Rusty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anyone who shared their life in a meaningful way with any animal knows that they have personalities, minds, and emotions. Absolutely. We have two golden retrievers downstairs. And yeah. they have such abundant personalities, and you feel yeah. it, you know it, and they tell you a lot if you just listen to their eyes. You know, I had guinea pigs, and they definitely had very distinct personalities, <laughs> very different from each other. No question. And, um, you know, it's, it's very obvious that, that we're not the only sentient beings on the planet. So Jane, knowing what you know now, how would you define humanity? How would you complete the sentence, humans are the creatures who... We have this intellect, and I think because we've developed this power of speaking with words, you know, that means that we can teach about objects that aren't there. Chimpanzee infants learn by watching and imitating but we can tell children about something happening on the other side of the world or something that happened a thousand years ago. Uh, we can try and explain the stars in the heavens. Yes. So we have that intellect we can use for creating control and aggression or for solving problems and creating yep. peace, right? Yep. That's, that's the whole thing. So we have not been using our intellect wisely in many cases. And if we'd had wisdom, we wouldn't have split the atom. And, you know, the wisdom of the indigenous people who make a decision after thinking, how will this affect generations ahead? Whereas we make decisions, how will it affect me now or my next political campaign or the yes. next shareholders meeting? Exactly. So we've lost wisdom. Not all of us, but by and large. And that's what we have to regain. And that's what we have to build into the youth today. Wisdom. And that intellect, which creates so many of the problems we face, also is a great source of hope. Because it gives us a power by which we could make better decisions. Yep. And we could turn things around. Well, I have a bone to pick with the media. Sure, we need to know about all the doom and gloom. We, we do need, but there are so many amazing people and wonderful projects around the world. They should give at least equal time. And there's this feeling in the media that it's only the, you know, the bad things that, that make people read them. But I don't think it's true. I think people mm. are desperate for hope. Mm. That's why, you know, we... We announced that Jane would be giving a lecture in Arizona State. Oh, no, I think it was in, I can't remember. With just two weeks to go and everybody said, oh, well, it's a bit stupid because we'll never fill the auditorium. But they were turning people away and that was 5,000 people because everybody wants hope. Yes, yes. So coming back to those young people, I'd like to just ask you, 
if you could say one thing to every young person around the world, what would you say, Jane? I would say exactly how you began this conversation. Don't forget that every day you make a difference and you can choose what sort of difference you make, that your life matters and that you have a role to play. I don't think there's a better message than that. No, nor is there one that we need more than that. Let me ask you a parallel question. What would you say if David Graybeard were sitting here? What would you say to him, and he could take in everything you said, about the relationship that you have with each other? You mean our relationship with animals? Yes. I'd say thank you to David for enabling the chimp study to continue. And he was yeah. such a, he was a leader, but not in the sense he wasn't a top ranking male. Mm. But he was gentle. If a young one was in trouble, they very often ran to, to David and mm. he would pat them or put his arm around them. And so when David set off somewhere, very often the others would follow. Whereas the top ranking male who got there through aggression, uh, nobody wanted to follow him. So there mm. were two kinds of leaders, I think, with people and 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 chimps and other animals too. Those that get there by sheer aggression, dominance, and those that people want to follow. I mean, people like Mahatma Gandhi and so on. Yes. Yes. Well, he, like you, was an independent thinker, too. That's right. Which took courage. Not be afraid to go out on a limb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People say, how did you manage in a male-dominated world? The thing is that back then, fieldwork wasn't male-dominated. It wasn't, there was nobody out there. There were two, two men studying, one gorillas and one baboons. But there was nobody else out there. So yes, people were studying animals in captivity, but not in the field. So I more or less had it all to myself. Mm. Jane, let me ask you a different, very soulful question. You have a powerful scientific mind. That's how you've changed our worldview about animals, our fellow creatures, and ourselves. But you also, at the same time, have an equally powerful sense of spirituality. It comes through everything you say and do, a sense of wonder, a sense of greater spiritual power, it shines. How do you reconcile both of those sides of yourself? I don't see any conflict. My mother didn't, and Louis Leakey didn't, and I never have. So that, you know, let, let's take it to its extreme belief in some great spiritual power, which can be called God or whatever. Um, and then the scientific uh, gradual scientific exploration of the wonders of the natural world, the wonders of the human mind. How do they conflict? To me, they don't. And I think what's exciting is that there's so much left to discover. We will never discover it all. Then some people believe that death is the end. Uh, other people, like me, believe that the end of this life isn't the end of our consciousness. And there's so many books now about near-death experiences. And somebody asked me the other day in a big lecture in Canada, um, what's your next great adventure? So I thought for a bit, nobody had asked me that before. And I, if it had been like 20 years ago, I would have said, going to explore the unexplored areas of Papua New Guinea, for example. But that's past now, I can't do that. So I said, dying. And there was a kind of collective oh, sound like that, and then a few nervous titters. And I said, well, you know, when you die, there's either nothing, which is that, or there's something. And I believe there's something, and I can't think of a greater adventure than discovering what that something is. So the woman who asked the question, she came up to me afterwards, and she said, Jane, I've always been afraid of dying. But now I think about it, and I think it might be rather exciting. 
Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Well, I got a, a letter from the head of the Jane Goodall Institute in Spain, and he said there's this young man, he doesn't speak English, um, but he's been living for two years in unendurable pain, and with his parents' consent, he's only 20, uh, he was going to do assisted suicide. He just couldn't take it anymore. And he's always loved animals, so could you send him a note? Which, of course, was a bit difficult. Yes. But anyway, I, I did a video for him, which was obviously had to be translated. But I said, you know, I believe that after death that maybe we'll meet. You love animals, I love animals. And so maybe we're destined to meet sometime in some future space. And he wrote back and he said, Jane, I've always been terrified of dying. But now I'm not terrified at all. And his mother wrote after he'd gone. And she said, Jane, I can never thank you enough. You gave my son, whom I loved dearly, the last week of his life with a smile on his face. Hmm. Such power in that formulation. The next great adventure. One that we'll all enter at some point. Just please don't rush, okay, Jane? <laughs> it's not up to me. It's I up know. To, up there. <laughs> I have one more question for you, though, that's related, because it's about mortality. You have a birthday coming up, and whether you're 29 or 89, I can't remember, but one of those. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. <laughs> and it is customary on your birthday to make a birthday wish. I now would love to know, Jane Goodall, Dr. Jane, what is your birthday wish? Right now, if I could have one wish, just one wish, I'd say stop that war in Ukraine because it's horrible and the death on both sides and the suffering and how it's affecting global hunger. That would be the best present I could have now. But, um, you know, there are so many other things to wish for. I wish Roots and Toots would be in all countries. I wish, well, what would your wish be? I wish that people would cherish this beautiful but beleaguered planet that nurtures all of us and our fellow creatures, and to cherish the wondrous places and the inspiration. I wish for a higher consciousness for all people that would lift ourselves, our fellow creatures, and this wondrous planet. Yeah, well, you know, if it wasn't for the war, my wish would probably be that we learn to live in peace and harmony with each other, with animals, and with the natural world. And we stop destroying, we, and we get to understand we are part of the natural world. We depend on it for food, water, air, everything. But yes. we depend on healthy ecosystems. And I see an ecosystem, like take a forest, forest ecosystem. It's like a beautiful living tapestry of life. And each little species of animal and plant, as well as the big ones, they have a role to play. They're all interconnected. So as you gradually lose species and they become extinct in that ecosystem, eventually the tapestry will hang in tatters and that will lead to ecosystem collapse, which is what's happening. Yes, yes. And that forest ecosystem supports so many wondrous, diverse creatures that we hardly understand at all. There's so much no, knowledge there. There's so much fellow life forms there. My favorite description of a forest was Shakespeare's passage where he describes a woods as a place where he could find books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and goodness in everything. I knew you were going to say that. It's never been said better. Yep, quite right. <sighs> well, 
Dr. Jane, <laughs> you have been so generous with your time. Let me just say one last thing in parting. Jane, really, from my heart to yours, you are an inspiration to us all. You are yourself a force of nature <laughs> for saving our world and ourselves. And you're a living example of the power of every person to live mindfully and compassionately and courageously. And best of all, you give me hope. You truly do. It's my job, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but it's your job because it's who you are. So in that thanks is not just for all the things you do, but it's the compassion and grace and courage and love with which you do all of that. Well, you have the same qualities, Tom, so... We just go it together. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just knew you were an incredible spirit the very first time I heard you. And that was 40 years ago, Jane. And here you are, so much brighter. That shining is so much brighter and more powerful and full of rainbows and starlight and, and supernovas. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we've got to give people hope. Yeah, and it's true. And at the same time, they've got to know no hope unless they do their bit. I agree. So last of all, to all of my dear listeners out there, I urge you to visit the website of the Jane Goodall Institute. Check out the inspiring and courageous work that's happening all around the world perhaps near you. And if not, start one right there and see what you can do yourself to help. Be a force of nature, like Jane Goodall. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom, and much love to you and success in your next endeavor. Thank you. To everyone out there, let me just say thank you so much for joining us for Magic and Mountains. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, may you have magical days. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Magic and Mountains, the T.A. Barron podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a five-star review, and share this podcast with your family and friends. For more information and to find all of TA's books, visit tabaron.com. Have a magical week.